Tommy Lane Reyes on location in Bali, Indonesia for a special edition of America's Now. First up, the Apex Summit. America's Now is in Bali reporting from the annual gathering of world economic leaders. All the big players are here. They'll be deciding the future economic course of the world. Next, a tale of two industries. Correspondent John Holman reports from Mexico City on two very different manufacturers, the makers of shoes and tequila. He'll tell us how they are faring in the current global economic climate and what consequences they are experiencing as a result of a key point of discussion here at APEC, competition. And then Enrique Peña Nieto. After 10 months in office, Mexico's new president is on a roll. Despite numerous challenges, lawmakers recently approved of his proposals for education reform giving momentum to his other reforms. But will growing opposition to that agenda derail his progress? We'll ask the source himself about the situation in a special one-on-one -on -one interview. Do you think that Pemex can currently run the way it is? Pemex will be owned by Mexicans. That is not going to change, but the energy bill that it's being reviewed at Congress is one that opens up to private investment. Mexican President Enrique Peña Nieto here at the APEX Summit. Finally, the flavors of Indonesia. A decade after a catastrophic tsunami decimated this country, we'll show how it has recovered and why it is still considered one of the most breathtaking places on Earth. Exotic Indonesia, through the lens of French filmmaker Christoph Hamann. Welcome to the broadcast. It could be called the summit of the superpowers. Leaders from more than 20 member economies all huddled together on the world stage and discussing the future of the global economy. Most of the countries at this conference border the Pacific Ocean. All of them are focused on bolstering their country's fortunes. But what exactly is APEC all about? To sum it up, trade, trade, trade. This is the Bali International Convention Center. As many as 20 heads of state, 50 ministers and 5,000 economic leaders from across the world are here. And they've all come to talk about business. APEC is the premier forum for facilitating economic growth, cooperation, trade and investment in the Asia Pacific region. The superpowers are present too. Together you could say they run the world. Many unilateral meetings are being held. Peru is meeting with South Korea to talk about energy, fishing and military cooperation. Chile with Indonesia to talk about their own trade agreement. CEOs from dozens of global companies are also here interested in trade in the region, from big mining corporations to technology startups. Harry Lim heads a company that wants to invest in Indonesia. This is his first APEX summit. Our investment in Indonesia consists of uh, so software subscription, uh, mainly to children aged 4 to 10. And uh, obviously we see that Indonesia is a, a potential market for us uh, with the growth of the population, middle income, uh, the interest of family to have better education for their children. Uh, the reason we are at APEC, obviously, uh, we like to know the government's regulation affecting our industry. APEC economies represent around 60 percent of global energy demand. The members agreed to establish joint ventures for the development of renewable energy. The goal? To reduce emissions by at least 45 percent by 2035. But many agree that achieving environmental sustainability across the region requires a lot more work. On the sidelines, sessions of the Trans-Pacific Partnership Free Trade Negotiations are taking place. Members are looking to lower trade barriers, but talks have stalled over agricultural subsidies, intellectual property, and special treatment for less developed countries. Summits like this come with a huge prize tag. Indonesia spent almost $30 million in upgrading roads, hotels, and airports, and even more on venues and security. Is it worth it? Indonesia thinks it is. And so does Wayne Forrest, president of the U.S.-Indonesia Chamber of Commerce.
the investment they see is probably well spent uh, because this is a very important island within the country's economy. Tourism is a very big industry in Indonesia and it doesn't pollute. It's uh, high service, employs a lot of people. They expect payback in the form of word of mouth, hoping attendees of the conference return home and encourage travel to Indonesia among their fellow countrymen. And with 50% of the world's power base present, it's a bet they plan to take to the bank. We want to turn your attention to a country getting a lot of attention here at the APEX Summit, Mexico. We'll have an interview with President Peña Nieto later in the show, but first a fiscal reality check. Mexico has the second largest economy in Latin America, but at the moment it's not doing so well. With growth projections expected to be at only 1% this year and severe floods in the south taking a toll on the government budget, Mexico is headed for one of the weakest economic performances in years. While the north of Mexico is bringing in lots of foreign investment for production of goods to the U.S. market, everything from airspace parts to medical supplies, the rest of the nation hasn't been doing as well. We thought we'd take a look at two different businesses and compare their durability in the current global marketplace. Correspondent John Holman reports for us from Mexico City on a tale of two industries. For Mexico, global trade has long meant a short hop over the border. Three quarters of the country's exports go to the U.S. And for years, Mexico's biggest competitor in that market has been China. It's often caused friction. But as both countries look around for other trading options, they're becoming something more than rivals. China is looking for new regional partners in Latin America. Uh, Brazil and Mexico are, I think, the two leaders in the region. Now China is second only to the U.S. as a destination for Mexican goods. We have had uh, a great deal of growth between trade and, and uh, investment between Asia and Mexico in the last uh, 10, 15 years. Uh, trade, for instance, has grown 800 uh, percent between uh, Mexico, for instance, and China. The relationship between the two countries is a work in progress. They're torn between competition and the gains they can make by working together. The first step in preparing the quintessential Mexican drink, tequila. It sells even more abroad than at home. Now it's gearing up for a new market. The best quality tequilas, those made 100% from the agave plant, have been allowed into China after a lengthy ban. Mexico's top exporter of fine tequila, Patron, is already getting in on the game. Actually, for Patron, we expect that China can be our second biggest market after the United States. This is talking about next five years. We will expect to have at least 2 million, 2,000 cases sent to China in the next years. And that, at the end, for us, is more jobs, more people. Tequila is benefiting from a goodwill gesture from the Chinese government. This year, it's also lifted a restriction on Mexican pork. The measures will have little impact on the economic balance between the two nations, but the message they send is clear. Mexico has been fighting for five years in the case of pork, three years in the case of tequila. It's an important signal. It shows a willingness from the Chinese part to change. Music to the ears of President Enrique Peña Nieto. He and the Mexican government see China not just as a lucrative market, but as a gateway to a continent where Mexico has little trading presence. China is uh, the relevant power in, in, in Asia, you know, in Eastern Asia, and definitely we need to increase ties uh, with, with, with China so that we can have uh, better access, better connect communication with the economies that are expanding and growing and opening up in, in Asia itself. Asian companies are already using Mexico as a vital link to the North American market. In factories like this one, parts from China are assembled and then exported to the U.S. The country's leaders have been taking pains to develop their strategic partnership, even getting it blessed by a Mexican shaman. But it's a partnership that's far from equal. Mexico's biggest exports to China are raw materials like minerals and oil. 
they generate about 10 times less income than the mainly processed products coming the other way. That's led to a number of Mexican industries being swamped by the influx of Chinese goods. The western city of Leon is the capital of Mexico's shoe production. The streets here are lined with shops selling every kind of footwear, but the industry is struggling. It's been deeply affected by cheaper Chinese imports. Antonio Canales has made shoes in Leon all his life. His business is just about surviving, but many of his neighbors' workshops have gone under, unable to compete. Libre. From 49, there's just 15 running. His grandsons are learning their trade in his workshop, but he worries that if he keeps losing out to Chinese imports, there will be nothing for him to hand on. The Chinese shoes are about 50 percent cheaper than the ones here. What it costs us just for the material is what they sell the finished shoe for. We're still missing the glue, the sole, the labor. We're right on the edge here. The country's textiles and electronic industries are also affected. Rodrigo Contreras says the Mexican and Chinese governments are working on the problem but no concrete course of action has been agreed. The shoe industry is uh, uh, an industry that uh, is important to Mexico. Uh, definitely, we have been working with the Chinese government to balance out the dumping, per se, of bad quality products uh, into, into the market. The Mexican government is trying to help other industries follow tequila into the Chinese market, but it's still very much the junior partner. And as the relationship between the two countries continues to ferment, it is yet unclear if they can successfully balance competition and cooperation. Our thanks to John Holman for that report. Up next, we sit down for an exclusive interview with one of the most talked about leaders in Latin America. Coming up. What do you think is the biggest thing that Mexico really wants to get out of APEC. Pushing forward free trade and to eliminate the barriers to trade internationally. America's Now. What's great about CCTV America is that we take you around the world and together we learn about the issues that affect us all. We're here to tell stories in a compelling way, and I feel this makes us unique. It's our job to make sense of this fast-paced, complex world. Every story worth covering has a real impact on real people. And if it's worth covering, you can bet we'll be there. Whether it's in Greenland, the Amazon, or right back here in Washington, we'll take you to the heart of the story. So join us each day on a journey around the globe on CCTV America. We are CCTV America. Welcome back. Mexico's President Enrique Peña Nieto entered office last December with a promise to create a new Mexico and turn his country into an economic powerhouse. Since then, he has helped pass legislation reducing the power of telephone and media monopolies and the power of unions over the school system. But his next set of reforms are even more radical and aimed at the country's hugely lucrative energy sector. They have fueled a fiery debate among opponents and put his ambitious agenda over a barrel. President Enrique Peña Nieto granted us the opportunity to speak with him about the rapid change taking place in his country. I sat down with him for an exclusive one-on-one -on -one television interview. Mr. President, we are here at the APEC summit in Bali. What do you think is the biggest thing that Mexico really wants to get out of APEC? Thank you very much for this opportunity. We are interested in the agreements that could derive from this meeting. In APEC, we want to concentrate on the main goals that my administration is working on, specifically pushing forward free trade, and to eliminate the barriers to trade internationally. And we want to work on more cooperation between 
the regions and countries that could uh, work together. And my country will always advocate for free trade, for liberalization, and I am interested in increasing competitiveness and productivity in the regions that we're part of. And we're also outreaching to other regions for strategic partnerships so we can increase our growth and provide better well-being socially. You know, Mexico has viewed China in the past as a competitor um, for foreign investment and exports. But is that shifting because you've seen Chinese President Xi Jinping three times in the last three months. How would you describe Mexico-China relations at the moment? We are relaunching a new relationship. We have identified agreements between President Xi Jinping in the three meetings that we have had so far. And we have agreed to give a new light to our relationship to create as well an overarching strategic partnership and that will help us explore new spaces in order to find new opportunities for cooperation, for better integration and a stronger trade relationship so that more investment from China can get to Mexico and specifically we want to see more Mexican businessmen and women in China. We have already an agreement so that products like pork and tequila can have more presence in the Chinese market. And there is no doubt that these are good indicators. This is a good sign of this new level that we have taken the relationship into. We are building a new relationship between China and Mexico. Mexico has a uh, huge trade deficit with China. Where do you see the best opportunity to increase trade between these two countries? Bueno, en lo hablado con el presidente de China está claramente well, we have had conversations about that with the president of China. During his visit in Mexico, he said it publicly. It was no China's interest to show a superavit, but uh, to open up the Chinese market so that more Mexican products could uh, land in China. And I've noted too, but we are working on other products that could be present in the Chinese market. And we also talked about the opportunity, huge opportunity that China represents in the world, in different markets and in different regions. And we want Mexico to be under its radar. That is to say, Mexico being a platform for production activities and uh, in our domestic market, we could uh, work on manufacturing activities that we can work jointly with China, and we want to serve as a platform to outreach to other markets that Mexico has due to the FTAs that it has. Mexico has different FTAs that uh, allow us to be present in 45 different nations in the world, in their markets. And I believe that uh, this is a very important and appealing platform that China could consider. Mr. President, you've been in office for less than a year now. You have a bold agenda of reforms, education reform, tax reform, energy reform. But I want to start with education. You have thousands of teachers taking to the streets protesting these reforms. Your own mother was a teacher. What needs to be done to get those teachers off the streets? This is what we have worked on in Mexico. Working on the transformation is inevitable. Reluctant attitude is inevitable. Some sectors don't want change to happen in Mexico has said to the task to have major structural reforms in place. Mexico wants to accelerate the pace of its growth, and Mexico is aiming to better social well, well, well-being in Mexico, and uh, the educational reform has been received with reluctancy, but this is just a minority in the 
in, in terms of the number of teachers that there are. And uh, we have been willing to listen, to address their needs, but uh, we have passed a reform already. The reform was based on a broad consensus at Congress. It was endorsed by the main political forces in the country. And now, well, we have to implement the education reform now. It is in the Constitution, in the procedures, in the secondary regulations. Well, we have to work on that so we can have better quality education for Mexico. Well, let's turn to energy reforms. Uh, you have the idea of opening up the state oil company Pemex to private investment. And there are polls that show that a lot of Mexicans do support that, but they don't want any foreign investment. So how do you decide what is the best way to handle that? Do you think that Pemex can currently run the way it is? I believe that the scope of the reform is at Congress. I've already presented a bill that it's, of course, creating debates, fora have been organized, and uh, the bill that I have presented to Congress is, is basically this. Mexico will own hydrocarbons in our country, but we need to find better ways to exploit this resource, and that is energy. We Mexicans own our energy resource, so we need to have security in terms of energy. We need more economical economic sources. We need to have more presence of SMEs in our country. We need to create our own gas. We, we should not need to import our own gas. We, we haven't been producing enough, and therefore we need to find new ways of exploiting our energy resources. That is my proposal, I must insist. The state will be the owner of hydrocarbons, as it is the case of other large nations in the world. The state is the owner of the resources and rules over all the activities related to energy, but we are taking into consideration what has worked in other places in the world, but we need to open up to the private sector. But some might look at the industry and may not agree. So would you say that Mexico and, and Pemex have enough to attract foreign investment? Pemex, eh, Pemex will be owned by Pero Mexicans. La, la that is not that going, that going to change, but the energy bill that it's being reviewed at Congress is one that opens up to private investment to exploit PMEX does not have the resources that are needed to exploit what we have as sources of energy, and I believe that the private sector could be instrumental to exploit the resources that we have. I'll give you an example. In the United States in the last few years, more than 9,000 wells have been drilled for shale gas exploitation. PMEX could only work on three when we know that our reserves are quite large, this energy is abundant in our country, therefore we need to exploit these resources the way it should be, and that is my proposal and the reform that I have presented to Congress, well, it's of course triggering a heated debate and some people disagree, but Congress will have to, to review my proposal. Some other political forces have presented their own bill, but we need to find the best formula to create energy safety. Que nos permita lograr seguridad energética para el país. And Mr. President, uh, you know, one last big concern on the minds of many is the fate of your team in the World Cup. What are your thoughts on that? Will they make it in? 
Bueno, yo estoy optimista. Lamentablemente hemos llegado I'm optimistic. Ya a un escenario Unfortunately, que no we have reached a moment that uh, we didn't expect and obviously we wouldn't like to be there. That is to say our only option is, is not to go to the World Cup. We don't want that and uh, as we all Mexicans trust on our national team, we want to play at the World Cup in Brazil. En la Copa Mundial de Brasil. Mr. President, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. Muchas gracias por esta entrevista y esta oportunidad. Y un thank you very much for this interview, and I would like to greet your audience, specifically Chinese people. We have very close ties. We have a good friendship. Still to come on America's Now from Bali, visions of a tropical paradise. Coming up. America's Now. Asia. Asia means business. Take a spark of intuition and a helping of inspiration. A dash of contemplation and a heap of experience. Add a good handful of character. Then turn on the heat. CCTV, America. Welcome back. The theme of this year's APEC conference is resilience, which means the ability to recover quickly from difficulties. Nowhere is that term more appropriate than right here in Indonesia. In 2004, this country was among 14 in the Asia Pacific region, demolished by a disastrous tsunami. It was caused by the third largest earthquake ever to be recorded and killed over 230,000 people. In the past decade, Indonesia has bounced back beyond expectation and regained its reputation as one of the world's most alluring places. French filmmaker Christophe Hamon recently captured the tropical beauty of this resilient nation and brings us this visual journey. us to the end of our broadcast this week. We'd love to hear from you about our stories from the APEC Summit. Please write to us at an at cctv-america.com or you could send us a tweet. Our handle is at CCTV Americas Now. Thank you for joining us for this special coverage in Bali, Indonesia. See you next time.